Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. We're glad to have you here with us at High Plains. My name is Tanner. Just got a couple of announcements before we begin our service this morning. Uh, first one would be if you're new with us, if you haven't been to our church all that much, we would love to uh, learn your name, get get uh, you some information about our church as well. So we have an info center uh, just at the end of the hallway as you're leaving, and just to stop and talk with those people would be my suggestion so that we can uh, make sure we learn your name and things like that. So uh, announcements. Here's what we have. First one is uh, Vacation Bible School. We have VBS coming up this summer, and uh, that still sort of might be in your head seeming like a long ways off, but there are things that we've got to do to prepare for it. So today is the beginning. I told the first service, this is the beginning of uh, my gentle pressure to encourage you uh, to volunteer, okay? So we need a whole bunch of volunteers to make VBS work, and so today would be the day if you have any uh, interest or desire to help out with those three days to sign up uh, because we get t-shirts for all the volunteers and to uh, prepare and order those t-shirts ahead of time so that everybody has a t-shirt and everybody's cohesive as the leaders uh, having the same color t-shirts on and stuff. Uh, that's what we would like to do. So if you would, if you have any desire to participate in that and we can have people as young as junior high age up to, there is no upper age limit, okay, to volunteer. So there are different areas that you can volunteer and I encourage you to Talk with Kylie. She'll be out here at the tables outside of the sanctuary to talk with you. Maybe help point you in the right direction uh, where might be a good place for you to volunteer. So please go talk to her after the service. Go sign up to volunteer in some area. We'd really, really appreciate that. The next thing is an exciting one that you've heard about a couple weeks now, that youth summer camp is going to be happening again this summer. We're doing it July 15th through the 18th. This is a camp uh, for our church, for our 7th through 12th grade students to go to. So last summer was our first time doing it. It was a bit of an experiment last summer just to see if we could make it happen ourselves, and it worked out really well. We felt that this year, this school year, we had a really tight-knit group of kids, both junior high and high school, because we had a whole bunch of kids go to our summer camp uh, in the middle of the summer and spend some time together uh, outside of town without cell phones and just uh, grow closer to God, grow closer to one another as well. So kids, junior hires, high schoolers, if you have not signed up yet or you would like to, there's a sign-up sheet at the info center. would encourage you to do that. Last thing I have is uh, graduation is coming up. And so with that, we always honor our graduates uh, the Sunday uh, of graduation, I believe it is. So on Sunday, uh, May 19th will be our graduation Sunday where uh, we'll have all the graduates, both high school and college, if they are here and able to, to come up on stage and we honor them. Uh, we have a message, Pastor Dan does a message uh, encouraging the graduate graduates, encouraging parents of graduates and things like that. So with that, there's something that we ask of you. It's to send in photos of graduates that uh, are a part of our congregation, or maybe you have a son or daughter who is graduating from college or something like that, They even if they live elsewhere, but they're a part of the church family in an extended way. We'd like a picture of them so that we can make a little video and put together to honor them that Sunday. So send in your uh, grad graduation photos, uh, either to Pastor Dan or call the church and find out one of our emails and just get it to us one way or another. If you want to, you can snail mail it, and we'll figure out how to scan it. I don't know how to do that, but somebody does, I'm sure. So that's all I've got for announcements. Let's stand, and we will pray together this morning before we go into our time of worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into this place today in order to worship you. Lord, we want to set you upon the throne of our hearts to remind our hearts, to remind our minds, to remind the world that we live in that you are our God and that you are our Savior. You're the one that we want to focus our life around. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a people who do just that, who don't just let your uh, influence, let your truth be a uh, tertiary thing in our life, something on the outside, something that's not so important, but something that is actually the key stone of our life, the thing that drives our life and the thing that directs our life. 
and shows us which way to go. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become a people who does that so that as we go into our jobs, as we go into our schools, as we go into our family life, in our homes, that we would be people who shine your light, who reflect what you're like, your love, your care, your grace, and your mercy, Lord. And Lord, we are thankful. We got to celebrate just a couple weeks ago the most important thing that we could celebrate, the hope of the resurrection. I pray that we would be a people most importantly marked by hope, hope in this world that can seem dark, hopeless, and just a hard world to live through. And yet, in spite of that, you offer us this hope, and a hope that uh, anchors us in the good times and the bad, Lord. So I pray that you would turn us into people who are anchored in that hope. Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak to us, speak to us through the words we'll sing, through the words of our pastor, through the words of an encouragement from a friend or a brother or sister in this room as we fellowship, Lord. I just pray that your spirit would be at work and that you would help us in the places we need help. Lord, we pray this and, and just expect you to help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear. chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood mercy reigns unending love amazing chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood's mercy reigns unending love amazing shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, the God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever
But truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good. God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring Thank you all for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Quick uh, reminder <clears throat> with our um, weather last week that forced us to cancel services, um, we always notify um, if we're going to cancel services. First of all, I always call Scott Matheny, the sheriff, okay? It's his fault. If, if you think, man, we shouldn't have called church off, it wasn't that bad, I'm, in, I'm innocent. Um, I check with Scott, and we try to figure out from as many sources as we can uh, whether we need to. And those times we do, then we post it on Facebook, and we send it out on uh, our email list. Um, many of you, uh, if you're newer, may not be on that mailing list, that email list. So if you don't remember uh, giving us your email if you would just stop by the information desk out um, <clears throat> near the entrance and get your, just give us your name and your email address, that will help us make sure we cover everybody that, that we need to cover uh, and get informed when, if and when we have to cancel. Scripture this morning, I want us to look at three passages and we'll read a bit more than I normally do. 
But the first one is found in Acts 9. The second one is found in Acts 26. And the third one is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> so we'll look first at Acts 9. And what we'll be looking at in 9 is the record of St. Paul's, Saul, known by Saul at the time, his conversion on the road to Damascus, his activities, and so forth. Then, no one's certain, 30, 35 years maybe later, um, in the 26th chapter of Acts, you have Paul, who is <clears throat> appearing before several governors, kings of the Palestine area, appointed there by the Caesar. And he is defending himself against charges from the Jews that as he went around all through um, what is today southern Turkey, up into Greece, and in Judea, in the Palestine, preaching the gospel of Jesus, they were accusing him of being a rabble, rabble rouser and of stirring people up and basically disturbing the empire, encouraging people not to worship the Caesar like they were supposed to do. And so <clears throat> he's been arrested. He's appearing before these Roman officials. And he's down in the city of Caesarea Philippi, which is on the Mediterranean coast. And some 35 or so years later, he's rehearsing his conversion experience that is in Acts 9. Then in 1 Timothy, you have his second to the last letter that he ever wrote. He's writing now from Rome. He's in prison. He's about to appear before Nero. And his final letter is 2 Timothy. Um, after that, tradition is very strong that he was beheaded by Nero in Rome. So that's the setting here. <clears throat> and we'll begin in verse 1 of Acts 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus, that's in Syria, so that if he found any belonging to the way, the Christian religion, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood stood speechless, <clears throat> hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground. Though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him <clears throat> so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here 
He has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed, entered the house, after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now, in Acts 26, as he appears before these <clears throat> Roman officials, beginning with verse 9. Part of his argument, we're breaking in in verse 9, begins earlier. So then, Paul said, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. In other words, curse Jesus and recant their faith. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, as I was journeying to, Mas to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you've seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those at Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. We'll end our reading there in that chapter. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service or into the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which is found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. By the way, just throw this in quick. There are people who quote that verse and say, you know, see, Paul was a sinner too. That's not true. Not presently. Verse 13 says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a hostile aggressor, a terrible person, but he wasn't now.
Okay, so. <clears throat> Christ came into the world to save sinners, whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 16 introduces to us a thought that is really pretty amazing. Paul says here, and other versions use the word pattern. Here, New American Standard, it's example. Paul says... Obviously, not out of any kind of attention for himself or pride or arrogance, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, I am a pattern for all those who believe in Christ down through the ages. He wouldn't have known it then, but down through 2,000 years and running, he said, I'm a pattern to everyone who believes. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he means, basically, that all of the workings of God on me, in me, through con conviction, through confrontation, through calling him, and then commissioning him to go preach. He's saying, in all of God's workings on me to bring me to him, I'm a pattern. I work basically, here's what the Lord is saying. I know circumstances are different, times are different, personalities are different, so forth. But basically, Jesus is saying this. I work in the same way, bringing people to me. So here's a pattern by which we can check ourselves. How did we come to God? Did we experience, maybe in different degree, maybe in different emotional, and maybe in completely different circumstances, but did we experience the fundamental means by which God reached Paul? Conviction for sin, conf confronting us, confrontation, and in some cases laying us flat on our back and then converting us dramatically, making us into someone else with a different purpose. And then commissioning us, sending us out to be witness f for Jesus, whether it was as a full-time minister of the gospel or a good Christian in our community, workplace, families, that we are lights for Jesus. So here are some characteristics of the way that Paul that God got a hold of Paul. And something I want to notice too is, again, we don't have exact years. But Paul was a young man, says he was a young man, when he witnessed the stoning of Stephen. And they laid, uh, the people doing the stoning of Steve, Stephen laid all their coats, because they were working up a lather, at the feet of Saul, who was to become Paul. And he watched Stephen as he was slowly pummeled to death with stones and died, fell to his knees and prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And then gave up his spirit. He saw that. That had an indelible mark on him. He couldn't shake the memory of that. It spoke to his heart. I think to a certain degree, what he witnessed with Stephen 
and what he saw from all the other believers. Paul, as far as we know, was probably a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council of the Jews. And so he was in a position of authority. In fact, he said, I advanced further than any of my peers in Judaism. Paul was, though young, he was a rising star. And prosper not only meant position, but it meant money and riches and power and popularity. He was considered an up-and-coming person. <clears throat> and he took it upon himself, after witnessing Stephen, to help push the persecution. And it says in the book of Acts that a great persecution rose up after the death of Stephen. And it says the believers were scattered far. I mean, they were scattered as far as to Babylon, to uh, over into what's today Turkey. They, they were run out of the city of Jerusalem. And so Saul then began, he was a leader in the persecution of the people of God. Well, God had plans for him, but he also, he has plans for every single one of us. He is not going to make you and I apostles. He did here, but he has plans for us. And when we go against like Paul was doing here, or Saul, was going against the will of God, Jesus said, you're kicking against the goads. He's speaking of the sharp, either pointed sticks or a metal-tipped kind of um, sticks in front of a cart or whatever, and the ox who didn't want to go backed into it, poked him in the back of his leg, hurt, bled. Being an ox, having the IQ of an ox, he kicked. He kicked against the goad. And what did it do? Tore his leg up. Well, I'll show, I'll show you. I'll just kick harder. Okay, have at it. And so they shredded their leg. And that was an, an idiom, a figure of speech that was very popular then. When you're pushing, they would use it even against the pagan gods. When fate, the will of the pagan gods, is moving you in a certain way, and you're fighting against it, they would say you're kicking against the goads. And the, the lesson is, you're only hurting yourself. You're not hurting the goad. You're just tearing up your own leg. And that beautifully transfers into fighting against God. When God is speaking to you, convicting you, reminding you, you're, th this is not right, you're on a wrong path, you're disobeying me, this is not my way, this is not my will, we kick against it. And I'm, th I'm convinced of this. Saul saw enough of the fruits of the gospel in the lives of people like Stephen and other believers that he was, I think Paul, Saul, was nearly, at least intellectually, and somehow down here, convinced that enough that he couldn't shake the idea that this Christianity, this Jesus, there's something to this. I think that that often produces, and here's where the pattern usually comes in. Paul described himself as, quote, exceedingly mad. And he didn't mean angry. He meant the old English word, for being insane, crazy, just nuts. It's when people begin to get under the 
heavy hand of God when they're walking against his will and they're sinning against God and they're pushing back, their opposition becomes odd. It's over the top. It's unusual. Whenever you find people that have such an explosive reaction to bringing up the subject of God or whatever, I always just assume, okay, that guy's had a run-in with God. And he is, or she, they're fighting an invisible fight that's going on down here, and they're convinced enough that they're wrong and he's right, that they're just gritting their teeth and foaming at the mouth. I used to, when I first got into the pastor, still in seminary, and we lived in a crummy parsonage um, up in a really, well, the county had a map of, of the eight or nine block square, wherever, where we lived and where the church was wonderfully located um, on a dead end street. That's a good place to build a building and have a church. You had to hire an Indian guide to get you there. But at any rate, on the county map, they had a kind of a stamp over this section. Depressed area. That's what they called it. That's where we lived and had, had a church. Well, I did some door-to-door -door calling. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But anyway... I, you know, get church brochures, and I went door to door in the whole neighborhood, inviting people to church. And I remember going, I'll never forget it, went to this guy's porch, knocked on the door, and, you know, fairly soon opened the door, and I just introduced myself, and, you know, I said, I'm from the church down the couple blocks away, and I'm just going through the neighborhood, Bam! I didn't even get any farther than that. I mean, I got this, I'm starting to get the brochure to hand to him. And he literally stepped back, grabbed both with hands, and raised up one foot and bam! I thought, probably doesn't want a brochure. <laughs> That's not neutral. That's a guy that had a run-in with God somewhere, and he won. You understand what I mean by one? He successfully said no. Except I'm sure God was still talking to him, even though he'd said no. And that was just grinding on him. Really, Saul was exactly like that. He was just fiendishly fighting against God. That's a losing proposition. Nobody's ever fought God and won. Fight ye not in the Old Testament, early in the days of the judges, one of the judges said, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. Nobody who tries to take on God comes out on top. So we will, to some degree, follow in that pattern. And then Paul tells us that he was on his way to Damascus and being exceedingly mad and nearing the city where he was happily, happily believing, I'm going to get quite a few Christians. We'll chain them. And we will bring them back to Jerusalem. And we will hold a religious trial with the chief priests. And if they're found to be um, fighting against, as they saw it, God, by following this Jesus, we'll put them to death. We'll stone them like we did Stephen. Well, on his way, Jesus met him. The first thing he did, and I, I, I want us to see, and I, I won't go over like I did this morning um, in the first service, 
Jesus, Jesus does what he has to do to get our attention. And as Saul's riding along, probably either on a horse or maybe on a donkey, um, for that matter, it could have been a camel, I don't know. They could have been on foot. But they get close to Damascus, and suddenly, with no warning, there's this bright, shining light out of heaven. He said, brighter than even the sun. And he was struck to the ground. All of them were. Paul, Saul, hears a voice saying, why are you persecuting me? Notice here, Paul thought that he was fighting against people, believers in this, to him, a false god, undermining the Jewish religion. Jesus made it clear you're not fighting against a person. You're dealing with me. That can't be forgotten. God brings us, does his best to bring us to the place where he says, no, your husband who is a Christian or your wife or that neighbor or that person that on the crew that keeps you know, witnessing to you or listening to Christian radio or whatever, they're not the problem. You're dealing with me. That sets it differently. He said, you're persecuting me. It's me, the Lord Jesus said, that you're dealing with. Nobody else. That sharpens it, but it also deepens it. This is God that I'm dealing with. I'm up against God. I'm not up against some person. It's God. That's a bad place to be in. And Jesus meant for Saul to see that. Struck him blind. He's led into the city and then for three days he's under awful conviction. And notice this. We obviously can't know everything going through his mind. But he's blind. He's stone blind. And who knows if he had any hope of ever re regaining his sight. He's thinking about his future. He's got three days to think about how am I going to make it as a blind man. What, what's happened to me here? What in the world am I in? Didn't eat, didn't drink. But notice this. Jesus talked to Ananias. He said... There's a guy, and of course Ananias had heard about him. He said, there's a guy on Straight Street, number whatever. He's praying. The older versions say, behold, he's praying. Well, that's where Jesus wanted to get him to. Struck him down on the road. Blinded him destroyed whatever his future he thought he was going to have. And he's hungry and thirsty and blind, and he's sitting in this house of a total stranger. The only smart thing he did was start praying. Listen, it's for my best. It's for my healing. It's for my hope. It's for my future. It's for my life that God may, if necessary, lay me low, put me down, so that he'll get me to pray. Paul turned to the right person that had just called him out of heaven. He started praying. Things started moving. Jesus said, Ananias, go talk to that guy. And of course, Ananias, we all recognize, Ananias knew better. He said, well, I can't go talk to that guy. My goodness sakes, he's killed people. He hauls men and women, gives his testimony against them. 
and they stone them or some other way of executing them. And Lord, look what he's done to all of your saints in Jerusalem. And Jesus goes, oh, man, I didn't realize that. I didn't know what he was doing to the people in Jerusalem. Yeah, he knew. I don't need... <laughs> and how often do we inform the Lord? You know, he, he, he doesn't realize. We've got to kind of bring him up to date. He said, yeah, I know. What did he say? Jesus didn't change his mind. He says, you go. And you tell him what I'm saying. So he goes. <clears throat> and notice the change in Ananias. He said, Brother Saul, laid hands on him. Brother Saul, he said, the Lord Jesus sent me here that you might receive forgiveness of sins, regain your sight, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. His eyes, whatever had happened to him, says, like scales fell. And it says he immediately arose and was baptized. He was converted. Jesus also called him and then commissioned him. And he said to him, I'm sending you to not only the Jews, but to the Gentiles to do what? The words here are interesting. Some... Some versions say, I'm sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God. The New American Standard that I read is more accurate, really. And it says, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness unto light, from the power of Satan unto God. That's different, and it's significant. Because ultimately, the minister, the Christian who's just witnessing to someone, we can only be an instrument. We don't do it but an instrument to open their eyes, show them the truth, give them God's word, and a changed life if they've known us. That's a powerful testimony. Then it's on them. Now, it's easier said than done because the devil is faithful. People come to church. I've been doing this a long time. People come to church and it seems that their hearts are hungry and God's talking to them and you're praying for them and you're working, you know, asking God to get a hold of their hearts. And in a lot of time, a lot of cases, they, in their hearts, they back up. They stick their feet out, dig their heels in, stiffen their neck. And then they're into a period where they, they find little tiny faults everywhere. I mean, I don't care what it is. Well, when, you know, the, the, I was sitting under a duct at the sanctuary and it was too cold, not, so I'm, I'm going to leave. I don't like the music, so I'm going to leave. Well, the pastor said such and such, and I just, I just, that was not, that was too harsh, and so I'm leaving. The, any excuse to get out of the line of fire. That's all it is. I don't want to hear what I'm hearing. So i got to figure some way, other than admitting the flat truth, i got to figure some way to get out. I've seen it happen, and then here's what happens. I will spend, or the youth pastors, the counselors in the youth work, or whoever, spends the next six months beating ourselves up. Oh, I probably, if I hadn't have said that, if I'd only called them this one time, listen. We can't go any further than opening their eyes by telling them what Jesus told us to tell them. Then it says, open their eyes so that they can turn. I can't turn them. You can't turn another person, only yourself. That they might turn from darkness to light 
and the dominion, the enslavement of Satan unto God, who's nothing like the devil's slavery. God is not a slave driver. He leads us. The Holy Spirit leads us. The devil lashes us. And he picks at us. And he harasses us. And he accuses us. And he gives us heaviness in our hearts and beats on us. If you would have done this, if you would have done... Listen. They put Jesus on a cross. He just said the truth. And they killed him. They haven't killed us yet. I'm hoping they don't. But the point is, all we do is speak the truth, let God open their eyes, and give them the opportunity to exercise their will to turn. Now, I've got to do this real quick. What we're talking about here that Paul experienced and that he went out and preached to others because he says, we can't turn to his, our time's gone. But he said, I, I wasn't disobedient to that heavenly vision. I went out and I preached everywhere that men should repent. Now, what is repentance? Let me say this, and I again, I have to be quick. <clears throat> repentance is the foundation of all the rest of our lives spiritually. A faulty foundation of non-biblical repentance will always leave you on a squishy kind of a foundation. It's not on a Gibraltar rock of repentance. I'm not saying that we can't, won't be tempted and cannot turn away. We can. But it's unlikely if we have a thorough foundation of repentance. And repentance has these aspects to it. Biblical repentance. God is godly sorrow for sin and a resolute turning from it. And it is the sorrow is not sorrow for what my sins have done to me and the troubles caused me, but I, I have a sense, again, it's against God. I broke Jesus' heart. I grieved Jesus at his heart, and he died for me. That breaks our hearts and should. So repentance is spiritual, meaning it's, it's not some physical or environmental change or whatever that I do. Um, I'm just, you know, resolving as, you know, I'm going to lose 10 pounds and I'm going to repent. Um, and I'm just going to straighten up. It's spiritual. It's heart deep. It's, it's dealing with God, no one else. So it's spiritual. Second, it's intellectual in the sense that I have enough information upon which to act. I know I have been doing this and this and this. I know it has been displeasing to God. He's made it clear to me, and I've got to acknowledge it. I'm not um, just a poor, well-meaning, bumbling, blind person. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew I shouldn't, and I did it anyway. That's intellectual. Third, to some degree... And it'll vary, obviously, but there's emotion. It's emotional. I feel, I feel that I've grieved God. I feel heavy conviction. And Paul later wrote in the book of Romans, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. We've and I wish I had the time, but I don't. We have completely maligned and mangled the scripture today and the, the plan of salvation and God's nature. God is basically, 
we all know he's this soft-hearted, squishy sort of a grandpa, great uncle, and he's just he just likes to hand lifesavers out to the kids. And you know, he you can kick him in the shins and he might rub his shin, but he won't take it out on you because he's compassionate and he's unconditional love. That's not the God. Is he unconditionally loving? Yes. Two of a sort. He's not unconditionally loving enough to let us into heaven if we haven't repented to the bottom of our shoes. God is angry with the wicked every day, he said. We have eliminated that from our picture of God's character. And he's just, a, he's just a marshmallow. No, he's not. No, he's not. There needs to be properly, and I know bawling and lots of tears may not mean anything, but there's a, there's a grief of heart. Repentance is volitional. Volitional means I make a choice. Decision is involved. I choose. And here's what we choose. Based on God's conviction and our acknowledgement of our lost estate and that we're under the death penalty if we don't turn. Under all of that, we come to the place where we say, Lord, I am done with this life. I'm through bucking against your will, stiffening my neck against what you tell. I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. I've had it. The angels in heaven rejoice when somebody gets to that point. And then finally, repentance is ethical. What I mean by ethical is if thorough repentance will permanently, if you you stick with it, Thorough repentance will alter your behavior. It's, it is ethical. You stop doing what you were doing that was against God. And you turn around and you walk with Him. You follow Him. You don't keep doing the things that got you under His anger in the first place. You quit. You quit. That's another thing I don't have time to go into. But we hear all the time, well, we just, we're, we just sin every day. You better not. Wow, well, you can't help it. Much of the problem with that, that we need, I need to concede, is just a befuddled, fouled up, dumb definition of sin. The kind of sin that brings God's wrath and you incur guilt is willful transgression of the known will of God. I know what he would have me do. I didn't do it. James says, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, that's light and information and it's a choice. To him it's sin. That God can deliver us from it. We stop doing that. I quit stealing, I quit cussing, I quit all the junk that I was doing before I got saved. I quit on my own strength. No, because now there was a power, because there was a person in here who enabled me to say no to temptation, to the current of this world. No, I'm walking with God by His grace. Now I have to quit. I think I went less minutes over now than I did earlier so that doesn't count as a sin maybe I'll we'll revisit this and finish some other things I wanted to say next week so let's bow our heads for prayer Dan if you'd come and dismiss us
Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And may we be a church that does all things to your glory. I know, Lord, you're speaking to hearts this morning in this church, especially about this idea of repenting. You give us the grace to do it. You call us to do it. You give us the grace to do it. And then you'll walk with us after we make that choice. So I pray that we would be a church of people, not perfect, but repentant with a godly sorrow when we miss the mark and that we get it cleaned up quick, get short accounts with you, turn and walk with you in the direction you would have us go. So no matter where we're sitting at this morning in this room, Lord, each one of us are having a conversation with you right now. I know you've been piercing hearts, speaking to hearts, maybe encouraging, maybe convicting. Maybe there are things that we need to repent and turn from today. If you've spoken to us, help us by surrendering ourselves to you to be obedient to you by your grace that we may do it to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Love you guys, you are dismissed. Have a great day, everyone.